Well, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, professors, colleagues, friends, everybody who's here and the online audience, uh, welcome to this meeting hosted by CIPRI and the Global Challenges Foundation on why climate change is an issue for the UN Security Council. Um, I'm going to move a bit further forward then I can see people here as well. Um, we're going to have a, a bit of a conversation between the panelists and then we're going to open it up for questions and thoughts from the floor as well. Uh, we aim to finish in about an hour and a half or, or thereabouts. Um, I think the only further technical thing I want to say to in inform you or to ask you is would you please all make sure that your mobile phones are switched at least to silent. Um, it's sometimes uh, good to disconnect yourself from the real world, but have we got <laughs> Twitter hashtags and, and stuff? No? No, but if you want to tweet about it, you know, feel free. If I see you um, tip-tapping on your uh, phones, I will think the best of you. I'll think <laughs> that you're communicating with the outside world and not that you're bored. Uh, We have a tremendous uh, panel here to, to be dis discussing this issue. Um, if I go from my left across, uh, Johan, Johan, I'm going to pronounce your name wrong, Johan. I'm That's really okay. sorry. I've That's been okay. here two years <laughs> in Sweden, and I don't know the simplest thing about Swedish, such as how to pronounce Johan's Swedes don't name. know that either. Swedes so don't know the name okay. either. Uh, there's many Swedes who don't pronounce any Swedish name. Uh, huh. So... Johan, there you nice. go, yeah. um, is director of the uh, Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, Malini Mera is, um, as you can see, um, the CEO of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not looking at it, Global, Global International, Global International, and uh, an ambassador, a representative and advisor for Global Challenges Foundation. And uh, Malini, uh, Marlin Mubiak, I always get confused, there's Marlin and Malini. <laughs> it's really, why did we set the meeting up this way? Marlin, Marlin Mubiak is a senior research uh, at CIPRI on and leading our climate risk program and our climate risk work. Climate change has been on the international agenda for about 30 years. Right? In, in the 1980s, the work started to be done, which really pinned down the issue of, of, of global warming, greenhouse gases, uh, and started to, to, to move forward. Uh, set up, first of all, the, um, the big Rio conference, and then leading on into the, uh, the Kyoto Treaty. At a point during, I suppose, the 1990s, work started to be done in various places about the relationship between environmental issues, broadly defined, and conflict mm -hmm. risk. Um, some, was, some was being done in, um, in, in Canada, some in Norway, a lot in the US, uh, in different other places throughout the world. There were beginning to be an understanding that environmental change, or our environmental scarcities, as one study named them, could have a major effect on security and on conflict risk. Um, at some point, I would hazard a kind of, you know, when you're not quite sure of your memory, it's not exactly a guess that you hazard a guess, but you kind of a, a stab in the dark, somewhere in the dim recesses of my mind. I think it's about 2002, 3, 4, that the explicit connection began mm -hmm. to be uh, identified, the possible explicit connection between climate change as one of the major environmental issues of our era and security and conflict risk. Mm. And I think that that issue began to be pinned down from about 2006, 7. Um, there were the reports coming out from the groups of retired uh, military officials in the, in the US. Um, there was work that Adelphi, a think tank in Berlin, was doing. There was work that International Alert, the NGO I was associated with in London, was doing. There was work um, being led by Professor Jeff DeBelko at the Woodrow Wilson uh, uh, Center for International Scholars in, in Washington, D.C. Was doing. So from these different places, work was being done which was identifying climate change itself as a security and conflict risk issue. 
And that further led to a number of then disagreements, disputes within especially the academic literature. Was there a basis for arguing that climate change causes conflict? Is that what anybody actually wants to argue? Should we be looking not at armed conflict, but at broader definitions of insecurity or instability? That discussion has moved on. And there has been, I think, increasing acceptance amongst governments um, that climate change does indeed pose, in some sort of way, some kind of risk as far as conflict and security is concerned. And then the next question from that is, OK, how to address it? And Sweden, the Swedish government, has taken a position which it uh, enunciated very clearly during its um, campaign to be elected onto the Security Council for two years, 2017 and 2018, that it would bring climate change to the Security Council. Right. So is that right? Why is that right? In what ways is that right? Where do we go from here? That's the bunch of questions which we uh, address today. So I, I want to start off. Uh, I'm going to ask each uh, panelist uh, the same question. And, it is, and I'm going to begin with you, Melanie. And it's really, from your perspective, what's your take on the link between climate change and issues of conflict, security, and insecurity? How do you see that, that link? Not, first of all, how should we address it? But how do you see the link itself? How, you know, elevate a question. You've got 23 floors, so that's, you know, you know three okay. minutes. So I, Off I, you go. I, I do the short straw. I'm going to go first. Um, I have to preface what I'm saying um, by admitting that I'm not a world expert on the issue of climate security, but I've certainly worked on it for up to a decade. And as Dan was talking, I was just thinking back to when I first actually in engaged intellectually and organizationally with the subjects of climate security. And it was actually, it was March the 3rd of the 4th, 2007. Mm. My God. And I remember How? that really distinctly because um, I founded and used to run an organization in India called the Center for um, Social Markets. And we introduced the concept of a positive leadership agenda for countries like India on climate change and did a lot of work with business and with cities. But we did a specific program on climate security at that time in Chennai. And the reason I remember it so well is because I had a nine-month-old baby at the time who I was nursing and I had a three-year-old who was just turning three exactly at that time who were in the other room. So running this seminar and it was... Um, it was quite the shock to the system because at that time, remember, we were just beginning to enter the era of uh, global um, discourse mm. on climate change. It was the time when IPCC had, uh, was about to get the Nobel Prize, um, An Inconvenient Truth um, had come out, uh, Al Gore was to jointly share that prize. So there was a lot of buzz, a lot of media attention to this subject. But climate security really was you know, a step in a different direction. And so when you ask me about what the links are, the links for me were self-evident. You know, if everything changes when the climate changes, you know, soil temperature changes, water temperature changes, your access to, water, access to basic hmm. services such as healthcare becomes much more uh, precarious depending on where you live and what the social infrastructure is, your access to water, your ability to harvest crops, um, you know, sustainability in agriculture, all of these things becomes um, affected, livelihood becomes affected. When people's livelihoods and, in and income become destabilized, they become vulnerable, it leads to social tension, which can lead to social conflict, which can lead to more um, violent conflict, you know. So the connections are there. At the time, we were beginning to make the connections because there was interest exhibited by the defense and security establishment in starting this dialogue. But over the course of the last 10 years, we have developed such a sophisticated understanding of, of climate risk and climate instability and the need for a uh, managed approach to climate security. And I have to recognize pioneers in that field, such as CIPRI, of course, and also Delphi and E3G and a whole host of other organizations. Um, but so let me give you that as a short answer. No, that's great. I mean, so everything changes because climate changes. And therefore, social arrangements, which have been based unknowingly, in some ways, on how the climate is, start to break down. And there's the conf conflict risk comes out of that. Mm. So, Johan, how do, you, how do you see it? Same question. What, from your perspective, what's your take on that uh, link? 
Thank you, and, and thanks for inviting me to this, uh, this discussion. I think it's extraordinarily interesting to discuss the linkages between climate and environmental changes in general, and societal responses and even security aspects uh, also in general. I don't want to repeat, I mean, what you, you broadly answered the question. I mean, if you have all these changes happening, uh, then of course it will have impacts on society, and of course one of the dimensions there are also link, linked to the connections between people and countries. Mm -hmm. Thus, there is a security issue. But maybe just add a few things uh, to the discussion. First of all, my background, uh, I have a much longer background to climate. I'm a paleoclimatologist by background, by training, and my focus was to look at climate variability since the last ice age. I'm not going to give you that long story. It's actually short in terms of geology, but still. Um, what is interesting, though, when you studied climatology back then in the 1980s, was, of course, one, Climate has always been a big driver for changes happening in society. So from my perspective, it's a bit surprising that we now think, oh, we have discovered that climate change can actually impact on society. If you look at history, there are you know, clear connections between climate variability and the fact that a lot of people left Sweden in the 19th century to move to the US during the Little Ice Age. There are quite strong connections uh, with you know, the conflicts we had in Europe in the 17th century, also during the Little Ice Age. You know, problems in agriculture, etc. So there are, in, all through history, strong connections. So of course, from that dimension, it's a security issue. And mind you, in the late of the 1980s, the worry among scientists was actually the fact that we were heading to the next ice age. That was the worry. And a lot of scientists argue that this is going to have tremendous challenges for society if we are heading to the next ice age. Then came IPCC the whole sort of science behind global warming, and we have to shift perspectives that actually we are, what we are heading now towards is a warmer planet. And I think sometimes it's interesting to have that little mm. background and understanding that the climate dimension, of course, has always been extremely important in terms of human societies, relationships, and so on. But just to add a few things and not go into, as you say, you know, impacts on water, that impacts on agriculture, that impacts on food security, it changes the whole dynamics on on security because you know, countries, more and more countries in the world cannot be food self-sufficient any longer. You know, the whole trade system becomes part of this. Yes, a lot of security dimensions. So that, I'm happy to discuss that much more. But what I would also like to add as a, an additional dimension into this discussion is, you know, even if you said, not, not to say what we do about it, but actually this is important because the security dimensions are also very much linked to the transition and what will actually happen in the next 15 to 20 to 30 years when we move away from the carbon-dependent, carbon-based economy and society. And we will see a lot of discussions around countries that will po potentially lose out, you know, countries sitting on huge resources that will lose out, sectors, of course, changing and people associated with these sectors, and we see some politics around this already, mm -hmm. and I think this is essential to keep in mind, you know, people losing their jobs and so on. But what is less discussed is, of course, also the aspect of control over new resources. So climate change is pushing a transformation of our energy systems and so on. We get new technologies, which means new natural resources, and also a discussion who controls these natural resources. I mean, rare earth minerals is just one case, and you can see exactly how China is acting already on this market. Uh, but I also think we need to discuss more, much more in relation to uh, planned adaptation, because quite often when we look at security dimensions, we are thinking about migration and, and the sort of extreme end, climate refugees, uh, even though I, we should be careful with this term, but still, you know, that's the extreme end. But if we are just looking at some of the really big systems changes that we can potentially have to, or we have to grapple with if, if, uh, and if uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet seriously starts to melt or the Green Line ice sheet, we will clearly have a situation where with time we can see we have to move people. Mm -hmm. So the, ad the adaptation strategies that we are saying countries must have will have big impacts on societies, even if they are planned, even if you know, they are thought through, even if we had the resources, this will uh, you know, include huge social challenges when we start to maybe move people around, not just in poor countries, I mean, take the US, uh, East Coast, Florida, whatever. 
that I think are also dimensions that we meet, need to link to the whole security discussion, apart from all the direct impacts that climate right. change will have. Yeah. Right, so, so the, the, the impact of the changes, as Malini said, but also the choices that have to be made actions, and maybe the prices yes. that have to be paid in adapting. Yes, and mind you, changes. I mean, look at some, uh, and to be honest, maybe say, more and more countries are seeing the opportunities of the transition also. And the question there is if you have an economy that can change, China, India and others are seeing we have an opportunity now vis-a-vis -vis the old world who may be stuck in old infrastructure yeah. and so on. So, Marlin, <laughs> your take. Thank you. And then, is it on? Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, go, yeah. Go. Just relax. Uh, just to, to add on these more broader terms, I think it's, it's relevant to go back what you, Dan, started with regarding this debate and dispute really on this climate change and, and more of the conflict side and really the security side, that, those kind of security types mm -hmm. of implications. I think it's important to highlight that this debate and dispute is not longer really there. It has mm -hmm. been really changed in the tone. You can see it up and then coming, but it's not really there no. due to the science base and the evidence base about these, uh, these implications. And I think it's important that the questions today is no longer whether climate change impacts security and peace uh, and conflict, it's how, mm. when, under what circumstances. So it's much more a question to understand the reason, the rationale and the different pathways and how different uh, stressors and things r interact with each other in order to in lead to more conflict situations. So that is one part of it. And then I think what is also very relevant is in this conversation is also a very strong understanding that the implications of climate change, first of all, inter it interacts with other processes exactly. of change, and which makes it quite difficult to uh, an analyze and assess, mm. but it's still there. It is also that this has reasons both for the causes behind conflict, the reason why conflicts occurs, but it is also changing the dynamics of already ongoing co conflicts, where, how the conflicts re evolves uh, in different specific contexts. So it's definitely that the, re the scientific, the evidence-based understanding is really much more profound mm. today. And, and there builds also opportunities in order to how to respond, how to develop assessment, how to develop policy in order to deal with mm. those challenges. I think that is really where we stand mm. today, to start to really influence and, and increase that work. Then I think it's also very important to, to highlight, and that's to, draws upon what, what you already talked about, this broader view, to also have a specific conversation regarding what do we mean by security? Mm. Whose security? Security, to, to have also understanding that the security implications of climate change are broad. There are different categories. Mm. Normally, you, you can divide security in different dimensions. We have state security, human security, community security. And climate change influences all of these mm. at the same time, which m really means also in terms of responding to this, it's really a matter mm. which we will come to a lot of different organizations and responsibilities to also deal with these challenges. Mm. So I think I stopped that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a mm. couple, of, couple of things to pick out of that, and then we will move on to the, the, the next set of questions that connect. One is stressing the question of climate change interacting with other parts of the social, political, economic landscape. I think that there is a risk that everybody who cares very much about an issue runs, which is that they, the risk is that you see that issue as being the only thing that's happening. So even in a small island state, right, low-lying, threatened by sea level rise already, climate change is not the only thing that's happening no. in that society. No. And it's, it's fundamental. It, it applies to, to everybody. Yeah. You know, I mean, all, all different. You, uh, the human rights activists, it's human rights are all that matters. The gender activists, it's gender differentials are all that matters, the, and so on. And it's never true. Societies are very, very complex issues. In fact, I think in one way that climate change as a topic and thinking about its consequences is a wonderful doorway into understanding how complex 
our societies are, both their fragilities and their resilience, which, which we'll also get to. The other thing I just wanted to mention is that for an awful lot of people, where this debate started was US admirals saying, well, with climate change, water rises and our naval dockyards are threatened. Mm. So let's look around the world and see about that. And that, was, that is what made some of the discussion of climate change um, respectable in the US. It's what opened the doorway for some of the discussion of the link between climate change and security. And none of you have mentioned it. I just mm. thought I would flag, flag that up. Um, I'm going to move to Johan now and then come back and so you get the third in this round with the question, which is, okay, climate change and security links are real, multiple, far-reaching across our societies, across our trading systems and into the future. So what are the appropriate policy actors mm. for uh, addressing the issue and try not to say all of them? I know, exactly. <laughs> That's, it's a good question, really. Uh, one interesting thing with climate and climate change is maybe not unique, but it's not that many challenges facing this, is the fact that nobody manages the climate. Even if you take water, if you take land, to a certain extent oceans, at least coastal mm. areas, uh, I mean, the climate, the atmosphere is really a common good. And nobody is really managing the atmosphere and, and climate. I think this is a fundamental problem, actually, to be honest. Uh, all others, you have certain actors who at least have more or less responsibility. Ministries to, you know, are responsible mm. for certain things. Biodiversity is a little bit the same, but even there, you, know, you have ministries managing forests or managing, you know, actors managing uh, wetlands or whatever it might be. So climate is really tricky from that perspective that you're saying. So... Uh, I think it's, ah, I, I don't have a good answer, to be honest, uh, I must say, because I think that the only way, th the reason the Paris meeting succeeded compared to Copenhagen, for one of the many reasons, I can talk a lot about this, this is a passionate area of mine, uh, I think the, the, the I'm normally saying that Copenhagen was really successful because it's shaked, it was really shaking up the system. Mm -hmm. One reason Paris succeeded, we can question if it will you know, be the success, but one reason it at least succeeded was the fact that suddenly you had almost all stakeholders there. You had the private sector coming in, you had cities coming in, you had regions coming there. You had so many of these actors that had been outside now coming in, pushing the political system you know, ahead of them. Mm. So that was the success of Paris, the fact that all these key actors when it comes to development, to economic planning, to you know, urban development, they're really heavy, those that actually shape our societies. They suddenly were at the table. Before, and even up to Copenhagen, even if we talked about it as a, as a critical issue, it was still seen as an environmental issue you know, in one corner a little bit. And suddenly in Paris, they all came together. What I think is more interesting is maybe to discuss, and I don't have good answers there either, but maybe to discuss how can you make sure that in this new landscape of all these different actors now coming together, how can we make sure that they, they work sort of in the same direction? Um, that I think mm. is key. But still, if you think that, you know, who should be more involved, I would argue much more focus on uh, process linked to global trade system, for instance. I mean, much more focus on processes linked to the whole, I mean, foreign direct investments. I mean, these big inv flows of capital across the, across the world, those are actors that I think somehow we need to focus more on to try to get them into this debate much more. Because again, I mean, a lot of people are looking at the climate fund, mm. but it's nothing. It's just a concession to get the Paris through, to be honest. I mean, it's, it's, it's important for really vulnerable countries and so on. But if you compare the 100 billion in that to the 90,000 billion that will be invested in infrastructure up to 20, 30 or 40, 100 billion versus maybe 1,000 billion, you know, it's sure. nothing. So if we don't manage to get the actors really shaping society behind this topic and mobilizing them, we will not succeed. I'm not sure that Security Council, by the way, is, is that important, but that's maybe for later on. Mm, uh, comes up. Okay, thank you. Well, and, uh, same I question. Yeah, I totally agree that 
in some respect, it, um, you can see how, how climate change influences everything. But of course, you need to be much more specific and uh, identify some form of hierarchy here, also some mm -hmm. different forms of responsibilities, and also relate to accountability. Uh, but if one thinks about in order to select this, in order to outline and out point out who are key, I think it helps to, to see that climate change changes our relations. Yes. It changes how the world functions and how we interact uh, with each other, within countries, across countries. So it changes the relations. And then organization with deals, with relations, becomes key foreign ministers, development corporation, uh, I don't know so much business, but that of course could be part of, course, of this. And also, it's not just state-based actors, it's also intergovernmental organizations, mm. uh, because they are part of this multilateral framework, and then they also become important in this work. So that is a short answer, then we can continue, mm. what should, you know, how to do, deal with this, what are the challenges for organisation, but I think that is something we could come back to. But if international mm. political relations yeah. are being changed yeah. as a result mm. of climate change, then they are those actors are, the, are, ones, are among are. the ones that have to yeah. engage. And, and in general, I think it is important to see that even though then it becomes relevant for all kinds, they are, you need to have a strategic leadership in organization. Yeah. Because since it could be, since climate change could, you know, it's, uh, it becomes everyone's business and then it becomes no one's business. I think that's why you need that thinking about the strategic, where are the strategic leadership? Where is that placed? And then I think the organization which are, are the centerpiece of organization for dealing with the relations becomes very important, international relations. Mm. Malini? Okay, so um, let me start by agreeing. I think that climate change certainly affects relationships, but it fundamentally also affects the operating systems mm -hmm. for yep. human mm -hmm. societies and everything involving those human societies. Uh, you know, whether it's our polities, whether it's um, our, um, you know, relationships within those societies, certainly it affects our economy. So it is fundamentally all pervasive. And um, I was really intrigued. Recently, I came across um, uh, something that Margaret Atwood, the Canadian novelist, um, had said how she thought of climate change, which was everything changes. Mm. You know? And of course, for those of you know, us who are you know, minimalists as opposed to maximalists and like to have something that we can get our hands around and understand in a very pragmatic way, those kind of definitions just seem all over the place. Mm. But fundamentally, it does affect mm. everything, and that's what makes it so, such a headache in terms of mm. policy and, mm. um, and uh, um, governance systems. Um, but I just want to take us back a little bit because mm. the conversation that we're having now is a reflection of our success as activists on this subject. Mm. I started working on issues 30 years ago that were called common security. Mm -hmm. Gene Sharp, common security, those of you who've done peace and conflict studies will remember, you know, at that time we used to talk about a holistic framing of peace and security issues within this new framework of common security, collective security. That was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about something very specific, which is mm -hmm. climate security. But when I started out as an environmental activist, you know, in the early 90s, in early 90s, for us it was really, it was a struggle to get anybody to listen to these issues mm. because we couldn't be, they were still stuck in the green ghetto. Mm. And we've pushed it so far that I remember watching when CIPRI released its report, I think it was December last year, um, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, mm. your report on climate mm. risk and security and what the Swedish government should do. There was a gentleman there, I believe he was the ambassador from Botswana and he put it beautifully. He said, we're talking about something that was an environmental issue and is mm. now a security mm. threat. And that shows the distance that we have traveled. Mm. And you can just put it as a marker from where we were in 91, 92 to where we are now. When this is an issue that affects everybody. And actually at Copenhagen, I was working very closely with business leaders. Yeah. I'd made a first film in India to show what India's corporate leaders were doing on climate change, what our green entrepreneurs were doing on climate change. And why did we engage with business and cities? Because we wanted to be where the grown-ups were. Mm. Because just environmental activists talking about these issues, nobody was interested in what civil society was saying, what human rights groups were saying, what indigenous peoples were saying. It was only respectable when you started to engage with the economics. And remember, Stern report came out in mm -hmm. 2007. Exactly. 2008 made a great impact. So the next leap forward for us was when the security and defense community started taking interest. And we were like, wow, we've reached Nirvana. 
Now we've actually got the big, big boys in the room talking mm. about it. And that's when you had things like the Claude Reynaud Review, had the Strategic Reference Review, you had any number of top military brass in countries from Sweden, Bangladesh, the United States, Canada, coming together and discussing the security implications. Mm -hmm. And there was pushback from us as environmentalists. Mm -hmm. Because we were like, we don't like this. We don't like the quote securitization. Because for us, it's smacks of militarism. This was then going to be a military takeover, just like we'd feared with the Global Compact. It was going to be a business takeover. Now it's going to be a military takeover, something that was so passionate for us. But no, you know, we've now emerged from that infancy, and it's wonderful that we can talk about climate and health, public health issues, because the health professionals have become totally involved in this discussion. That we can talk about climate change and law, because we've now built up a body of legislation, the um, organization that I'm proud to be associated with, Globe International, is a collection of lawmakers from around the world who have crafted an international architecture of national laws on climate change. At the time of Kyoto, we had about 52 to 54 pieces of legislation. We didn't call, the, call them climate at that time. And at the last count in 2014, 2015, we had more than 800 worldwide. And we've come so much further mm. with the Paris Agreement in 2015. Mm. So, you know, I think the landscape has been changed. Mm. There is a debate to be had about what the role is of governance because our institutions are lagging decades behind. Mm. We still have, you know, post-war 1940s institutions mm. to deal with that's such a cool. modern, complex, interdisciplinary yeah. problem. And that's why I think a focus on the, dis on the Security mm. Council is totally relevant. Can, can I just say very short? What I, find, I found, I mean, I, I found interesting, uh, there was this conference, remember, two years ago on climate and security in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. What I found interesting, however, uh, Milina, is that when, when this, this debate came up, whether you know, it's good or not good to link climate with security issues, I was surprised to see that it wasn't really, you know, the, all the you know, green scientists or NGOs being worried about it. Most of those speaking against linking it too much was actually from the military. Uh, because they said, they said themselves that there is a tendency, if you move towards the security dimension, that you get locked into sort of two sides much more. So I'm just, you know, that, that was... Well, there's, a, there's also another view from the military side, which is don't make it all our responsibility. And yeah, okay. They're, they're yeah. used to dealing with governments who find tricky problems and, you know, the military is an organization you can tend to rely on. It will tend to do what the government says, you know, ask to jump, it says how high, not, you know, what's your concept of a jump, which is what the rest of us like will be saying. <laughs> yeah. So that, I think, is part of the pushback yeah. that you get from the, from, the, from the military side. But I think it's also true that... Um, there was this sort of fear amongst um, in NGOs and also expressed in think tanks and amongst research communities using this, it's not just a buzzword, but it's more like a boo word of securitization mm -hmm. and actually not realizing that the, the issue has, it has a certain kind of weight. Some issues have a sort of inertial force which will take them in a certain direction. And one of them, I would argue, is that the link between climate change and security is inevitable yeah. for the reasons that you were all saying in the first question. Malini, can I come back and ask you the, the question? Because you gave a great answer, but it was probably a different question. What do you think the policy actors are that should, you know, you, may, you finished your, your comment right, by saying so the Security Council. So, okay. The policy actors are many. So if you're just talking about policy, there are very few areas of policy, including social policy, which should not have a climate-informed dimension right. to them. Right. But more specifically, if we're just looking at the fundamental unit of our human societies, you know, we increasingly live in cities. So if you don't have a managed, planned mm. response to human settlements, then you're failing. Yeah. And in that planned response, you will engage many, many, many different communities of practitioners. You have obviously, you have the defense, the criminal justice, you know, community involved. You have the health practitioners. So this is a challenge going back to, you know, the conundrum that we face. Climate change requires a level of interdisciplinary awareness and willingness to engage that we're not trained for. Yeah. So we have to retrain ourselves. And this is also the fundamental challenge of sustainable development. Mm. 
because it touches so many aspects of our lives that as people who are functionally specialized professionals, we don't feel comfortable doing. Yeah. So let me pick that up and turn it to Marlin and then we'll come along the line again. And then I'm going to open up and ask for comments or questions from, from you all. Do, do we, have a, a, we have a roving mic or will people just have to shout? We've got a roving mic, okay, fine. So the question which I want to ask now, and you, you set this up perfectly because you mentioned the interdisciplinarity okay. that is in some ways, I mean, this is, this is part of how the issue of climate change has emerged and taken a place on our political agendas, even more so when you, if you say climate change and security or climate change and health. So the Security Council, is the Security Council able to handle the interdisciplinary nature of the issue which Sweden, as a government, thinks it should be handling, which, to be frank, individually, I think it should be handling. I know you do, and she does as well, though he's a bit skeptical, <laughs> but we'll come along there. Someone should be. But is it, not, not with the other questions which one might ask about the political ramifications of it in this or that place, Right, but can it handle the interdisciplinarity? Uh, right now, I think the answer is no, but it definitely should develop for several reasons, that capacity and, and ability, because it's relevant. And then I think, it, I think in order to discuss the UN security agenda and, and whether and how, I prefer the question how they should deal with climate change, is to go back to also to, to think about the, pay attention to the mandate of the UN Security Council, which is really a mandate, it is to maintain, the UN Charter is to maintain international peace and security. And, and conflict plays one an integral part in this mandate. And the Security Council is one of the key actors in order to fulfill that mandate. And having said that, then it, it is one reason why climate change is, re is, is relevant. And then another step, I think, is, and, and that is also to, to add on on my first uh, comments regarding this with, the with relations, it is part also to see that dealing with the climate change and security is also, it, you have, it's all from a prevent preventive side until also dealing with the acute consequences. So it's also that different organizations have different focus in their work. And for the Security Council, today the Security Council is a very reactive organization. At the same time, it has a mandate to also develop its preventive capacity. And there have been, throughout the years, different reform trying to, to increase that capacity for being able to, to be more fulfilling this preventive uh, part of its mm. mandate. So I think dealing with the security, climate security challenges within the realm of the UN Security Council, it's really to focus both to respond to this managing the consequences, then there are a conflict, to have a capacity to understand the climate-related change linkages in that conflict in order to, to be able to respond and develop a, a, a peace process which could deal with that, the, with the root causes behind the conflict. But it's also to be pay, pay part in this more preventive work mm -hmm. in order for being an organization for diplomacy, um, for having a meeting, even though it's quite stalemated today, mm -hmm. uh, there are, the organization we have, where these countries are, are sitting around the same table. That's a reality. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's, not a bet, it's not the best one, but that is what uh -huh. we have. So I think one, one has to be quite pragmatic in that one. But then, of course, so it's, yeah, it should be there, but it, it needs to develop, and we can continue a little bit. How could that, such a process look like in order to develop this capacity? Malini? Yeah, um, you know, I was... I'm um, reminded. There we go. I'm still on air. You can still hear me. <laughs> yes. You know, the Security Council actually, this year marks 10 years of the Security mm. Council mm. debating mm. climate yeah. change, mm. doesn't it? Mm. Right. Yeah. So um, I remember um, the first ever open debate in the Security Council was in 2009, and it was initiated by the UK government. 
Mrs. Beckett, Margaret Beckett was there. And I'd served in the UK government just before then. And I remember that when the uh, debate, council debate was to take place, I mean, obviously the climate activists were absolutely thrilled, you know, we'd got it to the apex of the Security Council's agenda. Um, but I was really surprised and disappointed at the response that it has elicited, the negative response. Mm. And you spoke, we've already spoken a little bit about the sensitivities around securitization. But um, it's relevant to remember who objected. China objected, Russia objected, South Africa objected, India objected. Mm. And the reasons that they objected was they said, this is overreach. This subject doesn't belong here because there are other suitable bodies within the United Nations who should and can be discussing it. So the UN General Assembly, ECOSOC, and of course the United Nations Framework Agreement on Climate Change, which at that time, everybody was involved in climate negotiations, so people wanted to shut down the conversation and keep it to within the confines of the negotiation. Then we had another round in 2011. 2011, again, it was an open debate. So everybody debated, it was a formal thing, and this, was in, this time it was hosted by Germany. And what was unusual about this was that although you had the usual suspects, the G77, the non-aligned movement, the Indias, the Chinas, the Russias of the world objecting, you had the SIDS, the small island mm. development states, right? The vulnerables, AOSIS, which en masse objected to the objection and said, we are here because there is no other issue which is of greater relevance than our own security and we're going under. That was really powerful. And in 2011, I think it was the representative from Nauru who proposed that there should be a special representative mm. on climate and mm. security and saying that the, United, that the Security Council should have a mandate for reporting on climate risk. So they gave two specific proposals, neither of which ever saw the light of day. And this is going back six years. You fast forward, there were similar debates, not open debates, because then people learned there's going to be such pushback from the Chinas, the Indias, Russias of the world. My God, we're not going to have an open debate. So they re resorted to something called the ARIA formula, yeah. which is effectively an informal discussion, an informal discussion, right? So since then, we've had these informal discussions. It was Spain and Malaysia which had one, the United Kingdom and Ukraine. There was another one with SIDS, I think, which was um, uh, facilitated by New Zealand. So there have been a number of them, right? And again, it's all been blah, blah talk. But at least you get the talk mm. on the table and it's recorded. What I think has caused a shift now is Paris. Mm. Because that landmark agreement in December 2015 means you can't go and whine about keeping it in a cupboard, right? In the UNFCCC. Because that debate has broken free. And we now have everyone and their dog and cat involved mm. as practitioners, right? So we've got all the subnationals engaged in the discussion. We've got business engaged in it. We've got the Pope and the faith communities mm. involved, in addition to the usual you know, troublemakers, NGOs, activists, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so it's a debate which has broken free, which means that the Security Council, because the security links are so blindingly obvious, they would be to an infant, okay? It doesn't require maturity or sophistication or a, you know, a PhD to understand that there are clear security links. So I think it's changed the receptivity of the Security Council. And we did have a chink in the armor of Security Council members this year. Because if you recall, there was something, there was a resolution that the Security Council passed in April this year, which referred to the Lake Chad Basin because of the catastrophic drought mm. which is taking place in the four countries in the Lake Chad Basin, in the Sahel. And the Security Council members actually went out to the mm. region mm. and they did an investigation and they came back with the first resolution that includes a reference, mealy mouth though it is, on climate change. So that's there and um, I well, think it's a reference on climate change relating it to the peace and security it is situation. Indeed. Is That's it indeed. Indeed. So yeah. it's created a precedent and we need to kick through that door now, I think. Because everybody is lined on the side of this needs to be now treated with the seriousness of intent that the military have been asking us to do. Because you're quite right, it's not just their job. They're not the, you know, um, the first responders of last resorts. Every time there's a hurricane the civil, you know, civic administration can't deal with or floods or any other natural disaster, you call in the reserve army or your conscripted army. Okay, so um, there, is, there is a real opportunity. Um, obviously, I think that the, the elephant in the room we haven't spoken about is how, two things. Number one, how the security general responds 
to this issue because previously we had Ban Ki-moon. Ban Ki-moon threw, threw his heart and soul into mm. climate advocacy. And he even very unusually, he spoke at one of these open debates using his authority as, um, as the Secretary General and spoke in favor of the Security Council mm. taking on the climate risk related security aspects. We haven't seen the same energetic response from Mr. Gutierrez. And of course, we've got the Trump administration. And uh, just to show you what a chasm there is, a difference between the two, um, you know, we had Susan Rice, who was the ambassador in 2011, who, when uh, the subjects of, of the debate were shot down, she said in these memorable words, she said something like, it's short-sighted, it's pathetic, mm -hmm. and it's a dereliction of duty not to talk about these things. So fast forward, you now have Nikki Haley, whose claim to fame is that she was a governor of uh, South Carolina for several years, doesn't know anything about this, and will shut down the discussion. So there are some real, real politic problems that we have, but I think we have made the case and won the case in a court of public opinion, and we should be very determined in how we go for resolve from the Security Council. So office. when Malini goes kicking down that door, <laughs> are you following on or are you trying to hold the door? Well, I don't have so much to add after that uh, intervention, to be very are you, honest. Are you persuaded? <laughs> yeah, I'm persuaded, I'm persuaded. No, well, I mean, I, I, I normally say that I am a bit skeptical about linking uh, this to, to the Security Council. I mean, and I guess it's for the reason that I'm not always sure that the hard security framework or you know architecture is the best place for issues such as climate change while of course i 100 percent agree that there are all these connections mm. it's just that there is a i feel that sometimes there is a tendency for certain bodies to mm. really lock positions which doesn't really help finding solutions Maybe Security Council is changing. And I think, I mean, I, I, I would be more than happy if we continue to see a positive development. I think it's great what Stipri did also, you know, together with Sweden organizing the session in New York. I'm, I'm pushing it. I'm really, I think it's really important. I'm just worried that by linking it too much to this agenda or to this body as the key body in the UN system for security issues also carries a risk mm -hmm. with it mm -hmm. that it becomes... Um, part of the political game in the world between you know different powers while we have seen the positive development in terms of the paris agenda you know meaning that we work more bottom up that it's it is more about getting cities and companies and what not together mm. and work i mean that's also the the strength of the us right now is the fact that trump can decide whatever he wants to a certain extent or try to decide but there is so much pushback and there's, you know, there's so much positive process going on already. What you describe, I think, is more the Security Council responding to that yes, yes. than taking yes. leadership. Yeah. So maybe that is more the question. Yes, it is an issue for the UN Security Council, but I wouldn't think we should look at the Security Council for leadership. Uh, I don't think that this is what uh, the Council has shown in any other, you know, in most other conflicts in the world. I don't expect it to show leadership in this case as well. What I think is interesting sometimes is, is to look at other political bodies. So while you sometimes you, you may have strong um, conflicts between countries in, at the global level, in global bodies, you can sometimes in regional bodies actually find interesting possibilities for collaboration. We have worked a lot with the Arctic Council, for instance. Mm -hmm. And even if you have to be careful in the Arctic Council, you shouldn't talk about natural resources, for instance, or whatever, because it becomes a national issue. But still, in the Arctic Council, you can actually have a quite open discussion about climate change in the Arctic region. And there you have Russia and the US, and you have Canada, and you have others. So I, I'm all for, and I think it's great, and I think we should try to change the Security Council. I think we should try to get it in. They are infants, of course, if they don't understand that there are linkages. But the question is, so it's an issue, I can agree on that, but I would be very careful in pushing too hard to make the Security Council owners of the issue in terms of international relations. Yeah. Right, let's um, come out to questions and comments from I the audience and, no. we'll, I think you're right. and we'll, we'll come in with, with views person. about these, uh, these key issues. Uh, just two quick comments. One is um, Paris Agreement. Going into that, in the last, especially the last six months before the Paris conference, there was a heavy push to treat 
Paris, the Paris conference as a peace conference. Mm. And that, that was made explicit in the, in the build-up mm. to it, coming quite strongly from the, from the French hosts and the French organizers. And the other thing you said you know, about it becoming part of the political game, I think it is. I mean, I think that's where we are. Mm. Climate change and climate change issues are a part of political Absolutely. relations between states and within states, yes. and within the diff between the different levels, yes. if one wants to use that language, between cities and provinces, provinces and state, state and intergovernmental organization. Yeah. And that's not avoidable. So, in part, the tactical or the strategic question is, do you kind of grab that mm. and say, okay, it's got to be on the Security Council because that is the highest level body in the world. It won't show leadership, but it's the forum. Mm -hmm where it has to be discussed? Or do you try to go around it? That seems, mm. you know, and have alternatives. Mm. Or do you both do both? I think Questions yeah. and, and comments? Matt's over there, and then Jay back the other side. And if I'd seen your hand sooner, she wouldn't have had to walk all the way. But Thank you, a very interesting discussion. Matt, say who, I know who you are, but say who uh, you are for I'm the rest. Matt Carlson. I'm um, uh, director of the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. But since you asked the question, I also happened to be in the World Bank when HIV AIDS uh, was brought to the Security Council by Al Gore uh, about 2000 and, well, one or something like this. It was one of the first times that an economic or social issue was brought mm -hmm. to the Security Council. And it wasn't the fact that HIV AIDS hadn't been addressed during the 90s, of course it had, but it was reaching a level which was undermining mm. governance mm. in, in, in mm. southern Africa. And so I, I'm quite in favor of using the Security Council as a way of uh, driving also issues that go beyond the traditional remits of, of the Security Council. However, if you do it, it, it depends on leadership. It doesn't really depend, I would perhaps mm. comment or, or submit or suggest uh, on, the, uh, on the mandate of the Security Council itself. It, it, it depends on whether or not there is a group of leaders who want to use the primary apex bodies that we have. And of course we've lacked an apex body on economic and social issues in the United Nations system forever. Uh, for well-known reasons that we can uh, discuss. Ecosoc could never take the role. Other bodies didn't have the legitimacy. You, it was thrown around everywhere. What has grown is G20. And so we could, of course, also have been discussing, I know we're coming from the Security Council angle right here, but the title could also be why climate change is an issue for the G20. And then you come back to real leadership issues. Who is actually leading? Of course, Trump is definitely not leading, as, as we know now. And so, well, that was a comment, and my question is extremely short. How do you read China now? Mm -hmm. Is China honest or not honest? Are they, take, are they really going to lead or are they not going to lead? How do you read it? In, interesting. Let's take a couple more questions and then try to note things and put them together. Uh, Jai, over there in the corner. And again, say who, say who you are, because though I know you. That's yeah, uh, my name is Jai Zhao, and I work at SIPRI. Um, I have a question, and I want to bring it back to what was referred to as kind of um, the secondary indirect effects of, of climate change, which may also be the response that we uh, have to climate change, and this question of whose security. Um, so I'm, I'm talking more about these issues of green grabbing or biofuels and, and the other things that were mentioned, including not only just climate change, but also other things on the agenda, which may be social justice, inequality, broader issues of development. And should all those kind of, those issues also be linked to the climate agenda? Are they, I mean, they seem to be already, but I, I just, I just want to ask if, if that's too much of, too broad of an agenda, if we should be addressing climate change only, or if that has to be really incorporated into a more kind of global social justice campaign um, uh, in order to make sure that the, the response that we have is equitable, is, is actually in favor of, of everyone's security, not just mm -hmm. the security of few. And, and in that regard, I, I really want to, um, I, I fully agree that this issue of, of flows of capital 
it, that is part of how our entire global economy is structured. So what kind of fundamental reshifts can we, can we make in that regard? Thank you. And a third question uh, here. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Peter Wallenstein from Uppsala University. Uh, Dan and I were thinking about these issues 25 years ago, so uh, it's interesting that they remain on the agenda. Uh, so I have two, two things. Uh, I think I, I like the idea of taking it to the Security Council. The question is how you would do it in a way that is convincing to the Security Council uh, for taking it up. So I think it requires two things. One is a very strong documentation that there really is a strong link between climate change and conflict. And what we see today is more studies showing, yes, rainfall changes will affect local conflict. But that is not convincing enough because the mandate is to do international peace and security. So we need to show that it really has an international implication, not just a local implication. And I'm not sure we really have that. Uh, the second thing is that there, it's good to connect it to something that the Security Council already said. And it actually does talk a lot about sustainable peace. Uh, there is a resolution in the General Assembly, there is a resolution in the Security Council, uh, and I think uh, that would probably be the smart strategy to use it. Mm -hmm. And of course, if we are doing that, maybe Sweden will be chairing in about six months, I think. July. July. In July. Uh, so there is time to, to, to develop mm -hmm. this kind of documentation and demonstrate these links. Uh, and maybe that's what we should do uh, in order to use that opportunity as Sweden has a sort of a commitment to, to deal with this. Okay, let's um, take that um, set of questions. Let's try to answer in about three, four minutes each, which means you can't go comprehensively on everyone. I'll give you the yeah. first choice, one. Thank you. And I, I would like first to start back in order to, th to think how it works today and how it could develop. Uh, in the future is also to see the, going back a little bit briefly to the history that I think some of the strong opposition previously was related to that the Security Council also should have a mandate on mitigation. I think the Paris Agreement that was a key in order to resolve that uh, argument and, and thinking behind. So the conversation today is really how the Security Council should develop its capacity to deal with the consequences. Uh, and not mit mitigation issues, but more adaptation and dealing with adverse effects. Having that said that, I think it's very important to also highlight how numerous countries, all from different parts of the world, are no longer opposing this development within the Security Council. Uh, and I think we could go e deeper into, and here I think Jai could be even better to answer regarding the development in China, because it's really obvious as China are changing their rhetoric, their policy, and their thinking of security implications and their role in international communities. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely it's a change in that regard. Um, thinking about where talking about the role of the Security Council, it needs to be taken together with also the SD office and the role of the Secretary General, because they are working very close. It is the SD office who provides the reporting into the Security Council. And it is here, I think, one of the key, in order for this assessing, the assessment, it needs to be the SG office need to be able to report and describe in a profound way the complexities and how climate change impacts are influences conflicts. And I would say that even though the research to primarily where we have evidence focus on the local conflicts, the Security Council with UN missions are in areas in the Lake Shad where we have it, are in different parts of East Africa, so it's no longer, it's not a question. It's what is needed is the reporting to understand the dimension and the complexities that it, it is there, but it's not really translated in, in a form. And I think this with the resolution of Lake Shad really saw that the resolution is quite proactive. It also asked for this capacity to make appropriate risk assessment on climate change. And then the SD report comes a couple of months later on the Lake Shad, climate change is almost, I don't think it's even mentioned. Barely. Uh, so, hmm. 
you start to have some form of capacity to inform the system mm. about these questions. About well, that, these, that's what you need yeah, to have. Yeah, is that's that, yeah. what you need to have to start where. Otherwise, if you don't even have a appropriate system for knowledge provision mm. of already available knowledge, you need, then it's very difficult to start developing a possibility to develop how to deal with those. Mm. So you need to start to feed the system with this knowledge which, which are there. So there, need, there yes. needs to be some kind of point in yes. the SG's yes. office yes. which could handle the mm. documentation yes. that Peter was talking about, mm. for example, mm. and translate that yes. into a form that fits the yes. Security yes. Council. Mm. I'm going to go really? last because I'm just collating my points. Ah, oh, my God. You I, think <laughs> my, I was trying to collate my points as well, but okay, <laughs> I can try. <laughs> um, well, uh, a lot of interesting questions. Again, I'm also absolutely not an expert on China. And I think I've talked to a few co colleagues at SEI working um, ex exactly on this, the, the transition we see there. And, and what I think is interesting is, of course, that they bring up a lot of other aspects that obviously is driving policy changes. Mm which you, know, you think sometimes that, that this is a policy related to climate change, but obviously there are other aspects. They quite often, local air pollution is of course one issue in, in the cities and the middle class growing and, and pushing you know, for change, of course. Same happened in Europe uh, 100 years ago. Um, the, the fact that there has been a, a huge overcapacity in terms of uh, production of steel and so on, so, you know, it, Someone argued, I don't know if it's true or not, but that one of the reasons Mar Margaret Thatcher obviously spoke about climate change because that was a good way of saying that we should close the coal mines. So, you know, politicians are smart sometimes. I don't know if it's true. It's probably not true. Uh, but also because I think countries like China, but also India and others, they really see the opportunities of the new economy. They do that. They see the opportunities. And I think we do not speak, we, we talk a lot of politics, but what is obviously happening outside of politics is so interesting and I think technological development uh, in terms of, for instance, renewables, disruptive really, disruptive technologies, they change politics, they drive politics. I remember, I think it was two years ago, listening to uh, an environment minister from India basically saying that we will never, you know, leave coal because it's so cheap. We'll never, it will never compete with coal, it's so cheap. And this year, solar became cheaper than coal mm. in India. And of course, prices fell 80% between Copenhagen and Paris. How much did that impact on the fact that you dare to take bold policies in terms of energy transition? And I think you know, we have to really understand also all these outside dynamics that makes it possible to take bold decisions. Uh, you, know, yeah. you can demonstrate that it generates economic growth. You can demonstrate that it generates new jobs and so on the transition. It's only now that we manage to do that and thus you will also see a you know, stronger political push. So I think that is essential also in trying to understand maybe what's happening in, in China and India and so on because they see the opportunities. Um, I, I really like the question about also you know, the wider agenda and I, th I think it's absolutely necessary. I mean, we have to talk about the whole agenda, the socio-economic dimensions also related to, to climate change. I came into, even though I had a climate background, I came into climate uh, and the negotiations in the COP through water a bit. I was working on something called UN Water, which is you know, an inter-agency inter body with 28 UN agencies trying to cooperate on water issues, because water is like climate, you know, it's all, over, all over the place, mm. all over the place. And much more political, by the way, than climate. Talking about hard security here. What is interesting there is that we tried to push water into the climate negotiations, saying, you know, because we saw the climate negotiations as an opportunity to get water on the agenda. Stephanie knows this a lot. Because nobody wanted to talk about water, and water is not anywhere, it's so political. So we said, ah, but climate, climate change, of course, impacts on water. So we get the water in there. And we organized a water event in one of the COPs in 2008 uh, to really get there. And the countries that came to this water event, Egypt, Ethiopia, India, China, and you know, we were excited and we talked about transboundary waters and all the impacts of climate change. And they were, they were all sitting there. And then just after they said, if you try to bring in water to the climate negotiations, it's dead. It's dead. Don't bring water into the climate negotiations. I think we made huge progress since then because now we can actually talk about other dimensions than climate, really the socio-economic dimensions. But mind you, 
Search for water in the Paris Agreement. Mm. Search the word water. I think you find it once, maybe. Water is part of the climate system, and climate change acts through water on society. So it's difficult. And this is, have, have also been you know, the whole issue of how much do we move over to mitigation, uh, move to adaptation. And adaptation becomes much more political. And if you look at the climate negotiations, all the way up to Paris, actually, including Paris, a lot of people are trying to keep adaptation out of the negotiations. It's, more, it's easier to talk about mitigation. Adaptation is much more tricky, and adaptation links to water and you know, these other systems, which tends to be also politically extremely challenging. Mm. We can come back maybe to the, this financial issue, because I think that is also really interesting about financial flows and so on. As, I mean, there was also an adaptation. There was pushback against it because Focusing on adaptation was seen as being a confession of failure about mitigation. I know, and uh, yeah, exactly. And I, and yeah. I think that is the, one of the biggest errors because, it, again, it goes back, if you only know anything about the climate system, you know that we have always adapted exactly. to climate yeah. and climate change. This is not new. Malini. But okay. three, four minutes, because I want to come okay, back for another no, round of good, questions. I'll try and keep to three, four minutes, but I will talk very fast, because I yes. want to talk about three things. Okay, first, water and then China, and then specific thoughts about the Security Council. So, um, water, I think you are absolutely right. It is such an electric issue. Mm. Um, you know, in India, in the mid-2000s, when we were trying to make the case for the Indian government and Indian society to look at climate change, and the international discussions, not through a lens of fear, but through one of opportunity, People did not want to talk about emissions. They did not want to talk about India mitigating. But they were happy to talk about water. Mm -hmm. Because water depoliticized the issue for us domestically. Domestically. Okay, okay. domestically, mm -hmm. domestically. And then you realize, actually, the further along you go, you talk about water, and you talk about riparian states, <laughs> upper mm. riparian and lower row riparian states. Actually, even within a domestic context, it becomes highly conflictual. Mm. Because we have wars in the country, many wars in India, between southern states and northern states mm. because of access to water. Mm. And then um, I want to give you a specific example because it ties into um, a lot of these you know, themes around who controls, who wants to not disclose, etc. In 2010, you'll remember that we had these torrential floods in Pakistan. It was flooding in July and August, and it was the first natural catastrophe of its type that the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, classified as a climate-related weather event. 2010 Climate Pakistan, change related. Climate yeah. change weather-related mm -hmm. re event. And um, Pakistan has seen many catastrophic floods since, but these ones were more pivotal because they led to the largest, at that time, migration of people. So mm. 20 million people mm. moved mm. from Sindh, Pakistan, etc. And we, a group of myself, Indians and Pakistanis, through the World Economic Forum, decided that this was absolutely the opportunity to get India and Pakistan to talk about climate change, water, and mm. disaster risk mm. management. Mm. Okay? Mm. We could not include mm. the word water in our official literature mm. because water between the two countries mm. is a security issue. And the gentleman who's just left the room now was talking about the World Bank. You know, the World Bank in South Asia does not do water. It may mm. have in the recent, but in its history, it does not touch water. Mm. And so we, we, you know, we, we started this initiative between the two countries because we said, first of all, we have to have a sharing of information. The two countries don't even share data on melt in the Indus Valley, on glacier melt. All of this information is deemed as classified. So mm. we have a real problem so just in basic exchange of scientific hydrometeorological information, mm. okay? Um, now, what can, so just wanted to flag that, what can China do? Um, China, I think, yesterday was really quite a red letter day, no pun intended, for China, because at the 19th Party Congress, it was obvious that, um, you know, President Xi's ambition is to become the new supreme leader in the trajectory of the Mao, you know, and the Deng Xiaoping. And so he spoke of Absolutely, it was breath, breathtaking. He spoke of China as a global power. Not we are striving to become powers, we are already regional powers, but China as a global power, China now extending its sphere of influence beyond one belt, one road to the globe. Now, there are some people who would quake in their boots, but I think on the climate change agenda that China has a lot 
to, it's the safe area for, climate, for China to exert leadership on. I mean, you remember, he was, you know, he, when he went to Mar del Lago in spring to meet with President Trump, he didn't shy away from talking about no, climate change. He did talk about climate change. Now, remember, I used to be in the UK government leading on sustainable development partnerships with countries like China. And of all the countries I was dealing with, you know, India, uh, Brazil, South Africa, Mexico, China was a dream to work with because more than 10 years ago, the officials were serious. They had such a seriousness of event, of, of intent, of managing their environmental challenges. Mm. Now, it was pretty obvious even at that time that the key motivation was because this was a source of social and political conflict. And it was a conflict management strategy and a conflict prevention strategy why they had to deal with environment. So environment, ever since then, has become a safe area to play and have a public debate mm. around these things. It hasn't shifted because China then moved from fear to economic opportunity and started making the investments which has seen it become the green superpower on climate change. Okay, I'll stop on China, because I could go on forever. We can have a separate discussion just on China. But on Security Council specifically, I think there are four opportunities. Um, number one, it does not take, and I totally agree with you, having worked with politicians for several years now, decades, politicians by nature do not leave. They are receptive to what the public demands of them. And a good politician will frame the narrative that she or he is hearing from the public, make it their own, and exert leadership. But they are a reflection of what we ask them to do. So the Security Council is in a position right now where maybe one, two, three members of the P5, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six of the 10 can actually make a case for the Security Council acting under its own authority on the, pre on the responsibility to prevent agenda by doing really simple things, right? So right now within the UN system, we have member states who report on food security to the relevant bodies. Food security to the FAO, hmm. okay? So environmental risks to the, to the UNE, I have to remember, United Nations Environment, it's no longer UNEP on health issues to the WHO, etc. But there's nobody on which you can report to on peace and conflict and security risks related to climate change. Why not have reporting and disclosure become the norm just as it's become the norm for member states and a whole variety of other issues and certainly for um, businesses and states and regions because they're doing this already, reporting and disclosure. The second thing is that I think the... S You've got to be quick. Okay. Okay, risk through there. Secretary General missed an opportunity by not reiterating Chad climate security issues in his report to the Security Council. I think this shows a lack of courage and a deficit of leadership because he could have. He has the authority to have done so and I hope that he will show that he can do so. Mm. Thirdly, I think we have a real opportunity through the um, retired military leaders from key ranges of countries to actually come forth and demand dialogue with the Security Council on these issues. I think we've got to come to that point where we should be doing that. Final point, we haven't mentioned this, tipping points. There was a really good report last year by E3G, I think they came out with it in June, July last year, which looked specifically at the role of climate risk in the Security Council. And they spoke of the fact that no, in, no individual institution at a global level is monitoring, gathering data, monitoring, analyzing, reporting on tipping points around the world, okay? Whether it's permafrost, whether it's methane hydrate release, whether it's boreal forest dieback, you name your climate horror story, nobody is doing that. So there should be some kind of a working group within the Security Council. I mean, there are any number of institutional devices one can come up with, but I'll just leave that thought with you. Maybe I'll be just... Great. Um, <laughs> yes, another set of questions? Report so, I think that would be a uh, great idea. Who's next? There, pass it back. Mahakalan, I'm from the uh, University of Helsinki, uh, and I would actually like to ask a question that was uh, asked from me by some journalists, I think, uh, that because usually, like, when you have a common threat, it somehow should sort of, um, uh, you should combine your forces in order to fight it, in a way, uh, and clearly uh, climate change is a, is a threat to the whole world, in a way, so it would be ideal, in a sense, uh, to, to be that kind of a threat that, that kind of uh, makes all the countries in the world to fight against it together. So why do you think that, that it, it seems to me that it's, it's more like being this kind of a dividing thing that, that countries have sort of allied with each other and, and 
had different opinions about how to fight climate change. So, uh, why do you think, and, and is there any chance that uh, that this could change and we could find some kind of a common mm -hmm. uh, sort of way of fighting against climate change? When the world needs cooperation more than ever, why is it mm -hmm. being, uh, why is there more division? Mm -hmm. uh, one here. And then the next one that we take, if there is a next one, will be the last one and we'll come back to that. Uh, Prabhat, affiliate at the Linköping University. I was just, um, I work on climate policy at the national level and I was wondering that in climate negotiations, we have gone through the path of Kyoto Protocol, which was very much top, top down. And then we've come to Paris Agreement, which is largely bottom up, but one can, one can argue it's hybrid architecture. Mm -hmm. And now it seems like with UN Security Council, you're again going top down. You're going up, do you foresee uh, what would be the nature of a hybrid architecture within the UN Security Council? Or is there any possibility or is it, would it largely be a top-down architecture? Great question. Another one, last one? Going? Yep, over here to the right. Was there another hand about to come up over here? No, okay, yours is the last question. So. Uh, Christopher Berry, formerly with CIPRI. Uh, now I work with Responsible Investment. So tying on to that, uh, yes. Uh, Jay raised the question earlier of economic flows uh, and the econo economic system. Uh, what is the responsibility? Uh, and, and is it only something that we need to regulate or is it something that could actually lead? Thank you. Okay, uh, let's come back in the opposite. Direction, uh, Johan, Malini, Marlin, and I'll take the final word. And I, I focus then mostly on the yeah. first question. I maybe have some comments on the third one, but it's a tricky topic where, you know, I, I would not claim any expertise, but I'm just saying that I think it's extremely important that we look more into this. Uh, but on the first one, you know, can it be something getting countries together and, you know, really s making collaboration uh, the focus? I think to a certain extent it. It has. I mean, this has been the the change over the last couple of years that many of us has, uh, have tried to describe. There are many conflicts still and so on, but still, you know, I, compared to many, many other issues, I, I'm fascinated how, how climate change has really gathered a lot of uh, actors from, you know, from business to cities to countries to whatever, and still recognizing that we have a huge common challenge. And as I think you said, Marlin, in the beginning, we don't, we, you know, we are, we, are, we are past that conflict we had before. Of course, there are a couple of, you know, climate contrarians still, but we have really come out of, of that box. And, and if you look at a really great majority, regardless if we are talking about business, even from the fossil sector itself, uh, you know, they recognize that this is a challenge. However, I think there are a couple of fundamental problems. Um, one is that we are starting from very different conditions in terms of the urgency, uh, you know, dealing with effects. Sweden is a case in point. You could say, in, to a certain extent, it's surprising that climate change is such a big issue in Sweden because we are one of the few countries where, you know, really the impacts are quite, direct impacts are quite small. And we are even maybe one of the countries, to a certain extent, that actually benefits from climate change, to be honest. I mean, the Nordic regions, to a certain extent, Canada, Russia, we can probably increase agriculture, we, you know, forests uh, grow better. I mean, there are many aspects that, you know, could actually be beneficial for us. But even here, you see a very strong commitment that this is something we really have to deal with. But we are coming from very different approaches. So if you're from a small island state, you say, we will end in five years, you know, to other countries that, yes, it's a global challenge, but maybe not that urgent. Not yet so much. That's one dif you know, difficult uh, aspect. The second part of that, just very quickly, I do not think we, have, we should underestimate that there are huge challenges related to the, to the transition. And there are severe costs. There are you know, warranted fears. Uh, we laugh sometimes about you know, th these guys voting for Trump and so on. I think that is wrong. I mean, there are huge challenges related to the transition. Uh, risks of unemployment and so on. Risks of, of economic downturns in many countries and regions and for many cities. You know, and that we have to take serious. So even if we agree on the 
overall problem, we have to also be much more open about the problems and challenges related to the transition in order to deal with this in a, in a politically fair way. Um, and that we do not talk enough about, I think, to be quite frank. Uh, and we should be much more humble, I, I would argue. Um, and then just finally, I think on the, on the financial flows, um, I think we start to see a change there. That's the interesting thing, coming back to your, your question. The, the problem has been that the whole financial sector, if you take the financial sector itself, you know, as an isolated sector, they were among the last to really get into this discussion, I would argue, from the private sector perspective. The problem was also that they were very much focused on uh, mitigating risks. They're, they are very risk-oriented. What I think is an interesting thing happening now is that they start to see the opportunities instead in terms of investments and, and so on. Um, and there, I, I really am much more optimistic compared to a few years ago that they will become the whole sort of investment machinery of the world, linking up to urban development, linking up to this you know, one million people expansion of cities in the world per week that we have now. Indian Times writing that 400 million more people will live in Indian cities by 2050 compared to today. That's more than the whole US urban infrastructure to be built in the next 35 years. If we can get that force forward with the support of a much more uh, folk, uh, opportunity oriented financial sector, seeing the opportunities in these investments being the right investments for you know, long term sustainability. I think that is, that is actually f a fascinating uh, development that we only see the start of right now. So, I, I, I mean, these are mm -hmm. two aspects, but really on the first, I think this is one of my key points. We, you know, we have to really understand that there are many uh, people out there who feel threatened about the transition for good reasons mm -hmm. also, and not just because they are climate contrarians. Malini? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll take two of those questions. So um, to return to the first question, which was about the necessity for global cooperation, I, I agree fully with what Johan has said, in that that is the model that we have. Mm. And actually that model was very much set in train post Copenhagen 2009, because there was a perception that governments had not lived up to their expectations and that there was a retreat of politics from really dealing with this. And that's really when business and other communities stepped up and stepped into the breach. And actually what we saw with the Paris process and linking it with your question about hybrid architecture is Paris is the first global agreement which has a hybrid architecture. For years and years we had a top-down system, right? Remember the, the debates about bottom-up or top-down as if it was very binary? Actually what happened since Lima, Lima 2014, was when there was a recognition that there were so many people outside the central government tent, because at the end of the day, member states, it's all about central government and their ministries of foreign mm. affairs, that there were so many other actors who wanted to engage and contribute, but there was, no, um, there was no mechanism for them to do that in a formal way within a UN treaty. And so at Lima, there was this um, device constructed, the Lima to Paris Action Agenda, which enabled all of those non-state actors such a silly word, because parliamentarians mm. are non-state oh. and faith groups mm. are non-state, yeah? Mm. But everybody, all the rest of the world basically bundled in, and so they then made their commitments to whatever it was, you know, adaptation, CO2 mitigation, etc. And now we've come to a point that it was because of all of those actors coming together, pushing politicians, mm. that we got Paris. Mm. Mm. So what exactly. happens after Paris is that we are now further systematizing methodologies mm to recognize and account for mm. and attribute the contributions made by those actors. So there are lots and lots of institutes which are working on greenhouse gas emissions inventories so that companies which have signed up to very ambitious targets of you know, zero carbon by 2030, 2050, um, that they have a place where their, their work is recognized. So we are already moving beyond member states, right? I want to point out one thing. You know, in terms of the pushback, it's not just a game which is dominated by the activists, right? After President uh, Trump, when he declared that he was pulling out of Paris, who was the first group to step in and protest? It was business. business and it was a business community, mm -hmm. right? 
and everybody else came in much, much later. But it was because those top businesses have for years, they've switched on, mm. they've made the transition, and what he was doing was a risk to their investments mm. long term. So quickly ending on the UN Security Council, I think that this is one of the toughest, most recalcitrant, <laughs> most dated relics within the UN system. So I don't expect it to change, but I do expect it to respond. And that's why I think mm. that we have to have a strategy where we pressure them and confront them in the way that we manage to get reform out of the UN in the first place. I was part of the UN Secretary General's uh, UN Civil Society Relations eminent panel in mid-2000s. When we made the case we have to go beyond just the major group system to get the world engaged with the UN. And I think the Security Council is that last isolated piece, that tough nut that we have to crack. Marlon. Oh, thank you. And I will also try to grab all of this. I think the first question really regarding these different opinions, I think it's important to bear in mind that climate change is, is still very politically. It's, it's, it's about transformation. It's about questioning lifestyles. So that's, and, and it is, and it has inherent uncertainties regarding what knowledge we are able to have, not just what we, are, what we have, but also their inherent uncertainties. And, and those uncertainties can always be used if, regarding your interests. I think that is why, why that is part of this process, why you can, you can have those different, really strong different views and opinions about it. Um, so um, that's also why we often talk about risks rather than threats in terms of this area. It's risky because it's interacting and it also could have unfolded in different ways. But then I think regarding looking into more specifically on the Security Council, I think, and also relate back a little bit to the, to the role and, and the leadership issues here, I think uh, within the current Secretary General, you have a very strong, he has really emphasized the sustaining peace reform. Uh, also re reform UN, f finding place where UN could be more efficient, a uh, reduced bureaucracy, uh, and within his argument, it's always uh, emphasizing the root causes mm. in the sustainable peace reform work. And then, of course, climate change is, is one of these root mm. causes. So you have it in, in that mm. regard, mm. Th it's there. But then it is this, how to achieve this leadership role, because the leadership role within the UN is also need to take place in the SG office. Mm. And then that is also then related to the Security Council and the Security Council mm -hmm. mandates and its work. So I, I think that what is really needed here is really to, to how, how you can make a push and a pressure and, and argument and, and mm. support that process to take that leadership role uh, is really, one key in this. And then it's also uh, to also understand these different countries, and not least when you have the questions within the, within the Security Council, also to really understand what is happening among these uh, permanent five members, because they have a special role. One can question why they have it, but that is how it looks like. But they also have different agendas, and, and to understand their agendas, to, to really understand their argument, and also how they frame and relate and contextualize mm. these, these issues, is part in order to also having a dialogue mm. and the discussion to break those roads. Because in this, with the security, with the resolution of Lake Shad, they all agreed to having mm. a paragraph asking for better risk assessment regarding climate change. And that is a breakthrough, to have that in print, to have, mm. a, have a section really asking for this capacity, and that should also be used in mm. the process forward. Mm. Yeah. And I think what's so interesting about that is that it did come after the vi visit of the uh, UNSC PERM reps to the region, mm. so they saw. And mm. there are places and there are times mm. when it is simply hard, however diplomatically astute you are, it's hard to say that reality is not happening. No. Um, I think there's a, a couple of quick points which I want to make drawing out of what has been said and discussed. I think, first of all, the UN Security Council has a role. Climate change is an issue for the Security Council. But the Security Council is not the only body, either in the UN or anywhere else, that has a role. I mean, I think that that is one of the things which is really important to grasp 
with this. So the UN Security Council will also need some astute guidance from within it, from elected members, from the P5, from the SG himself, and from the kind of assessments that come through the SG's office about climate risk, mm -hmm. as to how not to overreach. Mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, I think, Jay, you asked the question, do, do we have to deal with this full range of connected issues to climate change? I think the answer is yes, we do, as researchers, as individuals, as activists, as citizens, as institutions understanding the problem. But does the UN Security Council have to deal with that full range in each and every resolution that it passes about a sec security question or even a climate question? Not necessarily. It, that may just overburden the system to do that. You may lose efficiency because you are going for, uh, for comprehensiveness. And the other thing, I'm not quite sure whether this amounts to a hybrid notion, right? But I think that whatever happens in, whatever change happens in the Sec Secretary General's office, if there can be a place which can handle these risk assessments, it's bound to be quite small. And there is a whole world of knowledge outside. There's a mass of research and knowledge and understanding. Some of it is formalized research. Some of it is quite informal. It's just local knowledge about what is going on. And that will all need to feed in. That is, a, in some senses, a bottom-up. But unless there is something at the top which can catch that, translate that in a way that works. But I think that's a relatively straightforward thing to do. If there's the willingness to do, to do that, to set up such a unit or a cell in the SG's office, it's a task which can be, which can be accomplished. And that, I think, is where I finish with this. You know, um, a better world is actually um, practicable. It's doable. So let's do it. And while, let's thank the panel as well for a great comments. And thank you very much, everybody, including the online audience. Thank you.